I want to take the next 20, 25 minutes to elaborate on this question, what should the Dutch do? Does it make any sense to pursue any strategy? And if so, what kind of strategy? Um, I'll start out with both Danny and, and, and Martin. If I hear what you're saying, you are a bit too polite to say, well, there's not much room to maneuver for you, so you just have to wait and see what will happen in the near future. But it does sound like something like that. There's no room for fiscal policy, there's no room for monetary policy, so we are left with the option to try something like industrial policy, which is not very much liked in the Netherlands, some locational policies, but actually we, we don't like them too much either. So is, is, is it basically a question of waiting until the Chinese take over? Or, for example, at the WRR, we are pursuing this project on how will we earn our money, our money in 20 years time, eh? trying to set up a sort of Dutch strategy for, for, for the next decades. Th does it make any sense to do that? Or is it just a question of lay low, see what happens, and then maybe in five or 10 years time, rethink your position? Martin, maybe start out with you. Is it you, I, you, you, sorry, you I, I pessimistic was the, but polite at the same I time. I was the one who outlined some possibilities. Uh, the, um, but listen to the and, subtext. Eh? And uh, Sheila just, I thought, was engaged in a tremendously vigorous assault on Danny. And, I'm, uh, the, yeah. and so why am I being asked? Uh, so uh, anyway, the, uh, I, I I, I, let, me, let, me, I let, let me just let me just comment very, very briefly since I raised some of the issues. Uh, the... Um, it doesn't seem to me the issues in the broadest sense uh, raised for the Netherlands are very different from those raised for Britain. Uh, uh, in this context, we're also a small open economy. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, but obviously the first point is that if you look at from outside at the current position of the Netherlands um, in the world, uh, you'd have to say this is a pretty astounding success. So that starts off. You have to start off with the, the recognition that this is a country that seems to have nav been navigating, uh, I think that's consistent, if I understand it, with what Sheila was saying, um, the, 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 the challenges of being a rich um, um, country with a very well-developed welfare state, uh, with all that implies, embedded in Europe, with the costs that implies, uh, um, that you've managed that despite, as I know very well over the last 30 years, many policy challenges extraordinarily successfully. You have some amazingly successful companies that operate worldwide. Uh, indeed, you're at, and it's an outstanding economy. I think only Switzerland compares, perhaps Sweden, but to a lesser degree in the number of globally competitive companies that are based here. Uh, you um, have run your affairs um, democratically, vibrantly, one would have to say perhaps sometimes a little excessively so, but certainly vibrantly without affecting underlying stability. So I think the Netherlands is a fantastic success, so you should continue to do whatever you've been doing. <laughs> beyond that, <laughs> beyond that, uh, you can't do very much about Europe, but probably you know, there's some influence there. I agree with that. Uh, I think the crucial thing to, to me is to see, to think about what are the things that are likely really to determine the prosperity of a nation over the next 20 or 30 years? And at sort of the very bedrock level, the very bedrock level uh, for a rich nation, it has to be preserve and develop what are the strengths of a rich nation? It's social cohesion, obviously, the, the quality of the labor force in the broadest sense, the uh, attractiveness of the place as a base for production, innovation, uh, first and foremost for domestic firms, but also for world firms, uh, and uh, the embedding of this entity within every international structure going that will enhance its ability to influence the world in its interests, which is most of them. So I tend to agree with Sheila's view on that. Those have seemed to me the essential things you have to do. And beyond that, you have to just adapt, because um, the, and as the Netherlands always has, because the world is uh, changing at a phenomenal rate in ways that we can partly foresee and partly can't foresee. 
and a small open economy in the end has to have the flexibility to cope with that. You can't anticipate precisely how it will go. And that really seems to be building on the historic strengths of the Netherlands. Okay, then we go into detail. Uh, we can go into detail about the different propositions you make. Let's take the one Sheila proposed first, because I agree with you that to a certain extent she may be criticizing Danny, but he should speak for himself. At least Danny makes this dilemma, or even a trilemma, but a dilemma between thinking and acting more globally and the, 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 the role of the nation state. And what Sheila basically says is that it's not an opposition. The only way to survive as a nation state, at least for a small country like the Netherlands, is to have some system of rules-based global agreements in whatever form. So it's not, not, not a dilemma, it's not a trade-off. It's not either or, it's working on a global level to have a rule-based system in order to preserve the nation state. The way I think about it, this is a point of difference. Uh, it is a trilemma in the sense if you want an absolute quantity of two of them. But my, the way I, I mean, perhaps that's not put very well, I tend to think that in fact all sensible countries would like to be at the intersection of the points. So that actually you want <coughs> a reasonable amount of all three and there are some trade-offs. That may be what actually Danny's saying when he talks about not going for hyper-globalization, he's talking for demo democracy enhancing globalization, but I wouldn't even go for that. I would simply say that a sensible country will want democracy to the extent that what democracy can determine is actually something that's really worth having, which isn't everything. I mean, we can democratically choose to miserize ourselves, but that's probably not, giving up that choice doesn't seem to be a terrible, terrible loss. Um, uh, international agreements to the extent that they enhance our ability to be prosperous, to make, give a stable world system. So I'm much more sympathetic to the WTO and the, than, 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 uh, um, uh, than he is. And of course that implies a serious moderation of, of, of sovereignty. Um, the, the, um, so I tend to think it's a trade-off in which we try to get a reasonable mixture of all three, but we never get absolutely everything we want in on any one of the points. Okay, Danny, to what extent is it a trade-off? There is a trade-off at the margin that um, if you want to increase globalization um, while uh, maintaining uh, democracy, that there is a sense in which you have to give up on your, on your national sovereignty. To the extent that you're not doing that, you're leaving, you're giving up on, on, on democracy. Um, I think Sheila gave us a very good account of how um, the EU, as it has worked, has been very good for the Netherlands. Um, and it's been a combination of essentially, again, uh, to put it crudely, the rules more or less being in the Netherlands' interest and the Dutch being very good at inserting themselves at the right point at the right time in the right way into the rules uh, to make sure that those rules reflected their own interests as well. I, I think there's, an, in, in, there's a very important lesson in, 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 in Sheila's uh, comments that, that uh, I try to emphasize too. That is that the conflict that, that rule-based globalization, that the globalization rules can enhance democracy by enhancing the ends which democracy are supposed to achieve. Um, what I was arguing against was that this is true as a general rule. So with respect to the WTO, for example, there are certainly some, some requirements, some rules in the WTO that enhance the functioning of democracy. I think there are others which do not, which do not fit into my understanding of what is the right, um, what was the appropriate length of a chain of democratic delegation. Um, and we can discuss that. Now, I think in, in, the, in the context of um, the European Union, you know, the, the issue, the application of the trilemma would be that I think too few political leaders um, in the European Union have been very explicit and very honest with their own electorate that in fact they were giving up national sovereignty. And they haven't provided a very good account, a very good narrative of how, in fact, this was in the national interest. This was in the interest of Hank as well as the interest of you know, those corporate fat cats. Um, and 
it, you know, the, the, the narrative instead that has been offered in different countries has been very different, ranging all the way from we're not in fact losing national sovereignty to, in the case of the French, being essential is the projection of our national sovereignty onto the Union. In fact, we are acting we're, you know, with much greater heft as a result of this. Um, and, and, and these are problematic and, you know, you know, I don't follow European politics very closely, but it seems to me that some of the backlash, some of the resentment has been due to this lack of a national political narrative explanation to the domestic electorates of, you know, not in quite the terms as Sheila put it, because, but, you know, uh, in, in terms that uh, explains um, and, and motivates why this, this serves uh, uh, the, national, the national purpose. Now, <coughs> this is a, not a, this is a proof of existence, but it's not a general, it doesn't say that in every case it's going to work out this, this way. And certainly at this point, the, the Greeks um, and the Portuguese and the Italians and, and are feeling very different about the nature of the rules. Not just they exist today, but the new rules that are going to come uh, you know, once the Dutch and the Germans and the French agree as to what that fiscal compact is going to look like. Um, and, and so there are, there are real trade-offs there. Now going back to the original, original um, question about what the, um, the Dutch strategy ought to be, I want to really emphasize that, especially in light of, of, of what Sheila said, which is the EU has been good for the Netherlands, you know, the question of you know, whether, which one of the five or six strategies that, that Martin laid out that is the most suitable for, uh, for, for the Netherlands is totally swamped and I think Martin would agree with that, totally swamped by the question of what's going to happen to the Eurozone. Uh, you know, so that's, that's a question that is totally irrelevant uh, at this point, uh, or no, it's not totally irrelevant, I mean, we can talk about this, but the real question, if you want to ask in terms of the Dutch national interest, it's really the question of is the Eurozone going to stick together? Will it, the Eurozone going to make, uh, make it through this? Or will it really fall apart? And if it falls apart, in what form is it going to take? Now you can say, well, the Dutch, the Netherlands is a small country, and you know, so we're, you know, we can't really do anything. But why take that view? I mean, I think sometimes small countries can speak with very loud voices. Um, and if I really wanted to make this, um, this, is, this, is, this is my last appearance today, so I can you know, be, be, if, you, if, you, you, if, if you're going to kick me out of this by, by virtue of what I'm going to say now, um, you know, the Dutch strategy right now, as officially articulated, is the Eurozone's problem, except that, you know, it's in small scale, so, you know, we can all say that it's not, you know, really close, it's not the source of the problem. But here you have a country where, with a huge external surplus, um, where you know consumption, private consumption has been go is, go is going down. Um, you know, with a political leadership that is arguing that uh, you know the, the only way to get the Greeks to to do reform uh, is to squeeze them harder and harder through austerity policies. Um, well, you know, and that you know the, that nobody should tell the ECB how to run their business. Um, now, I think that. Uh, you know the, that combination of official statements, it seems to me, sort of run completely counter to what any rational economic story um, about the, um, the solution to the Eurozone crisis would be. Um, now, it's another question whether if the, the, the narrative or the line was different, whether it would have any effect, we don't know. Uh, but I think, you know, why, why you know, not you know, take a position that seems to me to be much more consistent with the future healthy continuation of the Eurozone and the future Rather than, again, I'm going to put it in the worst possible ways, and I'll, I'll ask your indulgence for it, rather than catering to the domestic interests, um, to the you know, invisible and maybe non-existent hanks um, of this country by you know, taking this very hard line uh, about how you know, the only way to get the Greeks to reform is to, 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 to impose on them continuous austerity policy. So is there, you know, where should national energies and political capital in this country right now be spent on? You know, I would say you know, that's the agenda. Quite a lot of people agree. But there's a question behind this, and I 
would like to take that up because we could, I think, talk for hours about it, the specific strategies for the next week. But if I understand you correctly, basically what you're saying is we shouldn't look for this hyper-globalization and still respect diversity and therefore accept something like nation states and the choices on the level of, a different, of, of the different nation states. And they should be loosely linked, so to say, but not in a sort of straitjacket. If you look at it, if you look at the European Union from this perspective, you could also think that we've taken the wrong turn somewhere in the, 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 the 70s and 80s in deepening integration in the European Union on an economic level. We should have never had something like the euro. It might have been much worse, uh, much better to pursue a sort of political strategy, which the EU, EU was, uh, bring some peace or at least some, some, some mutual understanding, maybe enlarge even more than we're willing to do now, instead of having this debate on, 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 on deepening the integration, whereas that seems to be quite difficult and not desirable in itself. Would you take that stance and say we, we took the wrong turn discussing the euro? Again, uh, Martin will say yes. And I, I, I will say, um, you know, that I, I think, as I said, I think in my lecture slides, um, you know, if the, if the mortgage um, crisis had not occurred um, and the world economy had not been struck by, um, you know, a similar crisis over the next, uh, next few decades, after all, let's remember, Everybody expected financial crises to keep occurring in the emerging markets and developing countries, but nobody expected a financial crisis, certainly anything like this, you know, coming from the United States and affecting the, the European Union in that way. So from that vantage point, I say, well, you know, there was a logic, certain logic, uh, that said maybe, you know, it should have not been 27 countries or, or that many countries in the mm -hmm. Eurozone because that's really including too many, but that, is, that the, the fundamental logic was one where a bunch of countries like the Netherlands were willingly making this trade-off that we are after all not so diverse. We don't necessarily want all that many different things and we get huge benefits from this. What we're lacking are the political institutions creating the political space at the European level mm -hmm. and that's a halting process. But this is an ongoing process, and, and, and eventually, you know, we'll get closer and closer to that. Um, and, and that could have been, you know, that's, that to me was a perfectly sensible path. What wasn't sensible was a projection of the economic and financial union as it existed without an ongoing political effect, political eff uh, without an ongoing effort to fill in the political and fiscal and other institutional element of the, of the integration. Uh, Martin? <coughs> I just com comment on this because uh, I want to be very as precise as I can and see where we agree and where we disagree. Um, first of all, I was completely comfortable with everything in the European development and strongly supportive up to and including the Single European Act, um, uh, which occurred, of course, many people did think it was inevitably going to lead to a currency union, but I've, I've always taken the view that the idea that an, uh, what you might call a hyper free trade area, hyper customs union, whatever you call it, the movement to the single market is workable with uh, adjustable exchange rates. Uh, I've, I wrote a lot about that in the early yeah. 90s. Uh, there are problems with that, but I think it was perfectly workable. The idea that you had to have a currency union, as many thought, as a concomitant of a fully integrated single market struck me as false, or at least exaggerated. Then the question comes, uh, where does the currency, you, where did the currency union fit in? I think, I don't want to just look at it in the past because it indicates where we have to go, where the, where the Eurozone has to go. Um, it seemed to me that there were three possible fundamental views about how this uh, might work. The one is you create a currency union among countries that are economically very similar. So the overwhelming likelihood is that they would have very similar shocks at very similar times. The, the way the, mark, the economy would respond to monetary policy will be similar. Divergences, both exogenous and endogenous, will be relatively limited. And uh, 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 such a currency union seemed to me would be rather unproblematic. 
So uh, a currency union including this taken extremely at the Netherlands and Germany never struck me as a big problem either way. Uh, it would neither add much, since you were effectively in one anyway, uh, and nor would it subtract much. Denmark is effectively in a currency union with Germany for a very long time, no problem. Then you get uh, the question of a much more diverse second possibility. You include, because of the nature of the rules you have, which are not rules about economic structure, underlying true economic structure or competitiveness structure, just rather um, frivolous rules, I would say, about fiscal policy at a particular moment, inflation at particular moments, you include a very large number of very heterogeneous countries. And this then gets directly to Danny's point, and we'll come to the crisis. That can be thought of as working in one of two sorts of very crude ways. One way he described very well is the gold standard way, which actually is the model of the currency union, as it is now, except it's an inescapable gold standard. Uh, the, it's much more difficult. I wrote about that too in the 90s. It's much because many people said it's just like the gold standard. They were right, except that you couldn't leave easily. And that meant that any shocks would fall on both sides. But the essential point about the core point of the currency of a gold standard system is that if something goes wrong, you've got adjustment problems, how does it adjust? It adjusts through financial collapse, right? Let's be quite clear. You have financial crisis. We had lots of them in the 19th century. Big financial crises. Wages fall. You have high unemployment. Everybody is flexible. The government always is in balance. It insists on it, whatever happens. An adjustment is posed on, essentially, the labor market broadly defined. Okay? And I had took the view that that adjustment mechanism would not work in contemporary Europe. Countries would not accept it. Now, that's a fundamental political judgment. It's not an economic judgment. It would work perfectly well if, you know, Hong Kong operates like that. People, if every country in Europe would like Hong Kong, there will be no crisis now. But the problem, my view, was that in a crisis, countries would not work like that. And that, they wouldn't allow all their financial system to collapse. They wouldn't allow their governments to default. And if they did, there would be a massive political crisis. That leads you to the third possibility, then, of how to make this work, is that it becomes a collective endeavor in which you have to have, if you want it to last, enough shared economic and political institutions, just enough to make this work without becoming a full state. Now, I think the negotiation and debate now, and I underline very strongly what Danny is saying, in the long run, I won't even talk about what has to be done over the next few months or weeks or days. Um, I'm not going to go in Wolfgang Munchau's argument, it's all over by Christmas, so we'll assume that's not the case. <laughs> I think the point, the way to think about this is, on the basis of what's happened, what are the minimum conditions, given the fact that these are European democratic states, the minimum conditions for making this thing work in the long run? Fiscal rules, in my view, is part of that, but it's actually quite a small part of that. There are a lot of other things you need. I don't have the time to go through them. Then, once you've agreed that, then you can create a union that might work, and I think the Netherlands should argue for that. The very last point on this is, Yes, it's clear the financial crisis has made this much worse. It's made it much more imminent. But my own guess is, given the extreme divergences that occurred within the Eurozone before the crisis ever occurred, the massive current account surpluses and deficits, the incredible divergence in costs and competitiveness, that the crisis would have hit anyway, maybe not so severe. And it is an opportunity. And one way of thinking about it is, this is the chance to create the currency union that will last but it's not the one you have. Okay, Sheila, I think that the optimistic interpretation is, is something like this, eh? never waste a good crisis. Right. You, in fact, you need the crisis in order to make changes, otherwise you will never reach changes. Do, can you really uphold this position if you look at the actual political climate in the Netherlands these days? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I think that the, um, the, the German proposition for the Fiscal Union, which is one of the sort of uh, things we need for this, um, Euro to work. Um, um, I think if you would have proposed that two years ago in the Netherlands, everybody would say that's preposterous, we're not going to do that. Now it's sort of, we're okay ish with it. So it's, it, yes, um, you need this crisis to, to take really big, bold measures. Otherwise, it would never have happened. Okay. To conclude, I'm going to ask the three of you a question. And a short answer is enough. If you were 
the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. <laughs> and you could do two things. One on an international level. Eh? You would be on the phone with, with Merkel and Sarkozy tonight and what would you propose? And the other one is what would you do in terms of your domestic strategy? What would you set in motion? What would you work on in order to give us some prosperity in the next 20 years? Danny, what, 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 what should the Prime Minister say to well, Merkel or Sarkozy? I mean, I, I, think, I, I think externally within the European Union, I, you know, even though uh, you know, I'm the, the leader of a small nation, I would still be very vocal and, 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 and be, act as the, as the voice of economic reason. And, Saying? Uh, <laughs> uh, speak, speak truth to power. Okay, what um, would he say? What, 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 what would Margaret say to Angela Merkel? <clears throat> I, I, I think the economic. That's lower taxes, or what, what, what would he say? I, I think economically, what is required is fairly clear cut uh, that it is the, 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 that, that there are that, that there is a debt problem and that there is a growth and competitiveness problem. Uh, the, the way to solve the debt problem is going to be through a combination of debt reductions and uh, some way of reducing interest rates at the margin through euro euro bonds or, or some other guarantees that the competitiveness and growth problem needs to be resolved by a combination of you know countries doing you know what they need to do anyhow but that's not enough but uh, with a lot of help from the ecb in terms of targeting a higher inflation targeting a, 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 a depreciated euro um, and uh, surplus countries committing to much more expansion um, of uh, to to help the uh, the demand along um, uh, so uh, you know, e economically, okay. these are you know this is this is fairly clear. Then there are all these then the, the institution and political you know uh, requirements that go with it because it can't be just helping the poor countries along. In return, we want sort of some fiscal rules, some institutions to ensure you know, to avoid moral moral hazard and all those other things, and with some commitment to build political institutions where it's not just the Germans. Uh, telling the rest of the Europeans what to do, but that the uh, that the southern Europeans also get to have a say. Um, okay. And, and what would be his smartest move to boost the Dutch economy in the long run? Set what, in motion some industrial policy, or what? 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 What, what should he be looking into? No, I, I think industrial policy is, will play a, a role, but a, a you know rather small role. I, I think you know that that. I agree with everything that, that Martin and, and Sheila have said about the fundamental strengths and the foundations of that strength as a trade in, trading nation. And work on that, a strategy to um, build on that. So that's why I think, you know, sort of, you know, the, the continuance of the European Union and, and the Eurozone in some form is, is, is so much, is, is absolutely interest number one, two and three of, of, of this country. And I think anything that the um, leadership here can do. Okay. Um, would Martin, what? Should he do externally I, and internally? I, I mean, it's so difficult, isn't it? The, the, um, I'm going to take three things. Um, very first, I would like, I've said this, of course, of our own country, that the Dutch uh, take the lead in stating as clearly as possible that since it is absurd for the West to consider that it has a right to continue to run the world, and it is intolerable, um, we should take the lead in Europe in accepting the implications of that for our positions in every major international institution. Every major international institution. Um, two, um, I think the most important thing that the Dutch Prime Minister can say on the Eurozone is that if this is to work, everybody loses sovereignty, including surplus nations. Um, I cannot stress that point en enough. And the third point on the domestic scene is um, this country prosperity in the long run, apart from what happens in Europe and the world, and I agree actually very strongly in the need to sustain multilateralism. I think that's incredibly important. Um, prosperity ultimately rests on the quality of its people, the quality of its infrastructure, 
and the quality of its fundamental institutions, um, universities, political, and so forth. And everything that is done in domestic policy must be designed to strengthen those three fundamental aspects of long-term strength. And anything that fails to do that will undermine it. I believe that very small, very rich countries can survive and even prosper in this world as they come. But there are an awful lot of people out there who want to eat our lunch. So we're going to have to be better. And okay. we're going to have to go on being better. Okay. Sheila. Um, if I were the Dutch Prime Minister and I would be on the phone with Angela Merkel, I would probably um, tell her um, if she wouldn't reconsider her um, position on the ECB, that we, we need a credible lender of last resort. Um, that's probably what I would tell her. And on the international stage, I don't know, suck up to China, I guess. Okay. Thank you very much, all three of you. Um, we just hope Mark Rutte has been listening into this meeting, uh, and otherwise we'll tell him. Thank you, everybody, for coming here. It's time for a drink, and we hope to see you again next year. Thank you very much. Applause